Okay, well, whilst um, Keith is fixing up his mic, let's just crack on. Um, hey everyone, thanks for joining us, it's much appreciated. Um, as the title says, this is a live Ask Me Anything, we'll ask Keith anything, um, to do with BitTensor, otherwise known as Tau. And the reason I'm holding this is because I am the number one person to basically hold my hands up when, I, when I've when i screwed up. So one of the things I don't like about crypto Twitter or just, you know, people online these days is that they, they tend to just to sugarcoat everything um, and never admit when they're wrong. And one of the the biggest errors I think I've made this year, um, which I was telling to my community, is that I overlooked BitTensor too many times. And so originally when I looked at it, it was pre-subnets, pre, you know, all, all the fun stuff. Um, and I thought, mm, the market cap's too low, it's not for me, blah, blah, blah. And I guess the, the learning point I've got is to increase the frequency of relooks. So I'm bombarded every single day with loads of, I mean, my X inbox is filled with people go, hey, check this out, check this out. check." And so I have to filter things very quickly. And then I kept getting bombarded with Tau and I was like, mm. and the thing is, it took me, I, I did look into it properly for the best part of two or three months. And I just didn't understand it. I mean, you go on the website and, and the main homepage is, is a bag of balls, to be honest. I mean, I run a bunch of businesses and I'm aware of, you know, UX and UI and, and the website. <laughs> Sorry, whoever built it, but it is shit. Um, you then look at the white paper and it's 11 pages of maths. And obviously, I'm a little dum-dum here over in Norwich and I just couldn't get it. Even when I tried to use ChatGPT and Bard, basically copy and pasting parts of the white paper and saying, explain this to me like an idiot. Um, and that didn't work. Then I was like, explain it to me like a 10-year-old. Didn't work. Five-year-old. didn't still Yeah, so... I basically spent the best part of three or four months not understanding it and then I just sort of passed on it and then about a month ago I looked at it again and all of a sudden there were a load of different things which I hadn't picked up before and I realized I've been a prize idiot so thankfully I only got in I got into Tau quite late around $150 thankfully it's like doubled since then but um, a lot has changed since October, which we are going to prize out of Keith here. Uh, Keith, you, I can hear you speaking. How's it going, buddy? Good. Yeah, sorry about the mic issues. You know, I had my mic disabled for Twitter, and I've never been on a Spaces before and just listened to them. So I had no idea I had to, you know, authorize the input through the privacy setting of the iPhone, but here we are. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can hear your sexy voice now, and uh, yes, <laughs> so thanks for, for joining us. Uh, I'm just more than curiosity. Is Anna Singery your wife? Anna Singery uh, is my wife. She's ah, cool. in the other room, I'm sure, listening to this. Lovely. So she's going to appreciate like that she's on the space as well. Hey, <laughs> I sent her a talking um, thing just in case that your mic couldn't. Yeah, anyway. So, yeah, basically, I was just uh, saying how I've slept on uh, BitTensor too long just because I didn't understand it. And then finally. Um, had a big wet fish slap in the face and realized holy shit so um, Before we sort of open the thing up to you Keith Do you mind if I quickly share for over the next let's say three minutes a quick rundown on why I think I how I perceive bit tensor and why I think yeah. it was a revelation and then what I'd really love is for you to absolutely tear me to bits to see if one to check my understanding or if I've missed out on some bits and then I want to open this up to a live Q&A with, with the audience here as soon as possible. It, it, is yeah, that okay? Let's do it. Sounds good. Cool. Okay, so I'm, I've am i been trading for, I don't know, 19 odd years. I've got a bunch of businesses. So even though I'm full crypto since say 2016, 2017, I still am a bit of a conservative. So I look at assets and opportunities in the, in the light of a business. You know, does does it make profit, you know, revenue, profit, staff, all that sort of stuff. And and so, and I, yeah, I just didn't understand BitTensor. So the way I look at it now is that I think if Bitcoin, Ethereum, Tesla, GitHub, and Google all had a wild orgy and have a, had a baby, some secret love child, what would, what, what would it look like? And, I th and, and let's say it took all the best parts of that weird orgy. What would it look like? So just quickly running through this. So with Bitcoin, it you know it transmits value, it's censorship resistant. It's become an accidental store of wealth and a hedge against M2. 
uh, fair launch grassroots community well thought out tokenomics it's personal monetary sovereignty um, and a foreign currency for all it's um, decentralized no head honcho it's basically a several hundred thousand headed hydra it's the biggest supercomputer on the, on the planet by far but I think the most important thing with Bitcoin is that it's it's ha it's harnessed um, a harmonized and congruent incentive based competition system which is where the miners come in so they're all the best bits of Bitcoin which I think BitTensor has Ethereum similar things but the, the main thing with Ethereum is that it created a framework to explode innovation in terms of DAP, plat DAP platforms. So people can come in and build their Web3 you know, uh, DAP on you know, the ERC20 ERC network. Um, so they absolutely nailed that. And also, Ethereum is cash flowing now, when it originally wasn't. Now Tesla, what are the be best parts of that? It's basically the most in innovative company ever to exist, but effective, essentially, it's, it's one massive umbrella company for about 20 different mini businesses and when I say mini it's still billions uh, businesses un underneath it so it's not just a car company it's robotics it's AI it's insurance it's energy it's, it's all sorts of stuff um, github I guess it's a global re repository for the world of coding and then finally Google you know spearheading AI for years been trying to create AGI and progressing a lot faster than people expect I mean Jeffrey Hinton the godfather of AI has just quit as he's quite scared of what he's seeing at Google and so when you add up all of those really good bits of Bitcoin, Ethereum, Tesla, GitHub, and Google, I personally have come to the conclusion that BitTensor is that love child. Um, and when you sort of mull on that over the next couple of days or a couple of weeks or wh whatever, I think it will start to, to dawn on you like it did on me. So, so if before I waffle on any further, Keith, how, am I wrong so far? What have I missed? What am I? Yeah. Does that sort of explain BitTensor in a nutshell? I think you've nailed um, some of the elements. It's probably best to start with the, you know, the Bitcoin relationship or Go the blockchain it. piece. Um, most of the people on this call, probably coming from crypto Twitter, are familiar with the tokenomics of Bitcoin, right? 21 million, million coins halvings every four years this is the basis for um you know the economic that underlies uh the bit tensor ecosystem which is the tau token so the blockchain part of bit tensor um really is a means to an end I, I wouldn't even really call it as much a blockchain project but a artificial intelligence you know decentralized sort of intelligence farming project that uses the tokenomics of Bitcoin and the security of a blockchain um, and the trustless nature of that with with the delegating and staking which I'm sure we'll get into uh, to sort of secure the entire the entire projects incentive mechanism so BitTensor works the same way as Bitcoin four-year halvings it does have some deflationary mechanisms within it as well where um, Tau is burnt for various activities um, within the ecosystem, but the main difference between you know something like Bitcoin and something like BitTensor is that you know you mentioned Bitcoin being the biggest uh, you know supercomputer on the planet. If you add up all the hashing power that's going on you know across the world, it's hundreds and hundreds of times greater than any supercomputer, no matter which you know corporation or government you're talking about. Bitcoin beats them all. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, even the guy, the guys that founded BitTensor, and almost everybody within the, the BitTensor project, at some point also realizes Bitcoin has its place as, as a monetary instrument. However, all that hashing power isn't actually doing anything other than securing the blockchain through solving a lottery, right? If you kind of understand how Bitcoin works, all of that hashing power, is the blockchain, but in the end, doesn't produce anything other than security. Um, as far as as far as I understand it, obviously it supports transactions and these type of things as well. But BitTensor borrows all of that technology and security from the blockchain side, brings that into an ecosystem um, where you have decentralized sources of artificial intelligence generation, and uses that blockchain to secure the incentive mechanism that allows the creation of intelligence across you know at this point. 
32 different individual networks um, underneath the single umbrella of the BitTensor project, which those are the subnets that you mentioned earlier. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so what when you first came across it, what was it that slapped you in the face that you realized, holy shit, I need this? Uh, well, probably like anyone, you know, I had a portfolio in crypto that was distributed on several different projects that I thought made sense. Um, but once you start thinking about artificial intelligence and the way that it's going to disrupt almost everything, you know, on the planet that is that runs on electricity, um, you start seeing the applications of that. And, and if you ever sit down and think about it, you can never come to the end. You know, if you're thinking about a supply chain coin or, uh, you know, a coin that distributes storage or um, compute or all of these other different sort of like um, quantifiable um, things or commodities, intelligence is the one where there really isn't anything creating intelligence other than humans. Um, and when you have a system like BitTensor, uh, this elegant system that is designed to sort of tease out um, what's called distilled intelligence, you know, intelligence that isn't just like um, captured from, for example, oh, the temperature outside is 72 degrees and we're just grabbing all the temperature, but we're identifying trends of temperature across locations and, um, you know, being able to forecast the cost across those trends. And what BitTensor does is gather all of this data in a, you know, in these, in these, siloed areas and these are the subnets and through the specific mechanisms that subnet owners use to kind of tease this data out of their um, out of their miners they can then you know use this data to solve pretty much any problem um, or or any any kind of real world issue um, using the tensors distributed compute distributed artificial intelligence and the, and the blockchain that, that secures it all underneath so that's what grabbed me is that when I think about the project, I can never come to the end of the applications because as soon as you think about one and then, and then you can start plugging them into each other. So you start seeing how subnets can even then work off of one another and sort of have this mutually beneficial relationship where they're almost like multiplying the effectiveness of another subnet by, by using someone else's development. Hmm. So that's what grabbed me with the project is I, I could never figure out where the where the end of the of the thread was you know and I still don't think we know true so do you I, I guess for me that one of the, the the barriers which I just couldn't get my head around originally was that a, a lot of the literature and stuff you see online is like it's oh it's proof of intelligence proof of intelligence we're building a, an artificial brain you know like a neural brain a brain like a human all that sort of stuff we, do you think that Although, yes, that is the, the ultimate track where BitTensor is heading, it's so far, not far-fetched, but so far in the future that it, at the moment, let's say over the next five years, it's, it's really a negligible type mission statement. And that, um, th does that make sense? Or, I mean, how, yeah, how do you, what's your take on that? Goal, I don't know. If I think that's a large goal for the entire artificial intelligence or machine learning, you know, yeah. community to have its sights on. I don't think BitTensor as a project is being steered, um, you know, by some overarching force towards the general, the, the artificial, you know, the AGI that's that's you know going to kick off the singularity where the thing is able to improve on itself at, at a rate that just you know <clears throat> boggles the mind. This is not necessarily where we're at at this point um, with with BitTensor. We're more talking about individual, um, you know, sort of ecosystems that are being created underneath the umbrella of the entire project to solve specific issues. And then what you could see at some point is an overarching intelligence when it understands BitTensor being plugged into the entire ecosystem and using all of those individual subnets mm. almost as appendages or like feelers like an octopus would have out into the real world and bringing that information into you know, a central repository, a central sort of compute, and whether that's an LLM or some different construction, uh, I don't know. But there is no doubt that when this is one of the things I've always said too is like when artificial intelligence comes on online enough to realize what BitTensor is, if you give it any money, I know where it's going. It's going to you know the Tau Arcade. It's not going to go 
you know, buy any anything in the real world, it's going to go play with intelligence on on the BitTensor uh, network because that's essentially what the thing is made of. And if artificial yeah. intelligence is trying to improve itself, there's no better proving gr- or no better source for that than um, you know, a, basically a living intelligence network and, and constantly evolving intelligence network, which is what BitTensor is. I like that. Yeah, I, I guess it's effectively giving it real world capabilities but if it were to let's say jump into all the subnets it can do things straight away um okay so that's good right so i guess before we jump any deeper so to speak i I think it's it's probably best that you explain um subnets because to me that was the 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 game changer which i didn't see pre-october but in october subnets were launched and to me that was the equivalent of ethereum launching you know a dap platform um, so can you please treat everyone here like a five-year-old and explain the subnets and why that's so important? Okay, so I'm going to start with miners and validators first because we've kind of covered the blockchain part. So you've got the Tau. It's distributed through the ecosystem. Currently, it's 7,200 Tau per day. Um, that Tau, the 7,200, is split uh, hat, Well, 41% to miners, 41% to validators, and the remaining 18% goes to subnet owners. So if you, if you you know get your calculator out and figure out which subnets have which weight, which is um, something we'll talk about in a second, you can track where all the tau is going to go every day uh, based upon how the network is constructed. And the, and the construction of the network for each subnet is is essentially the same. The the bare bones of it is you have miners um, that are operating decentralized compute this compute could be a bare metal server it could be a uh, virtual private server it could be a gpu um, it could be their own hardware or it could be rented hardware most of the hardware uh, if i had to guess is actually rented hardware from something like you know vast or run pod or uh, liquid web or digital ocean or one of these sources for uh, for gpus and compute and, and these are, that's the hardware that the miners are running. So the miners are paying by the hour, by the month, whatever, to uh, have the luxury of using this hardware to be able to run the software for an individual subnet. So the easiest subnet really to get your brain around probably is the one that has built the entire BitTensor project. It's overseen by the OpenTensor Foundation. This is subnet number one. This is the text prompting subnet. This is, if you've been around BitTensor for a little while, some of the earlier um, uh, customer facing, you know, things that actually had a front end you could interact with, like chat with Hal and some of these other bots, were using subnet one to basically create that front end as, as the back end compute power. So the way that that works um, is that the miner runs a, a large language model uh, of varying size, you know, the miners have to determine how big that model needs to be um, in order to effectively answer the questions that are coming from the validators. So the process for subnet one to create this back end, which allows you to use it as a chat GPT um, you know, type of querying uh, device is that miners send questions out to validators and validators are sorry, Validators send questions out to miners. So validators generate the question or the queries. The miners respond to those queries, and the validators gather those responses from a number of miners. You know, depending on the subnet, it could be 20, it could be 50, um, and they'll score those responses based on their own models that are held within the validators. So, in addition to the compute that is being used to generate the responses by the miners, which is the the GPUs that they're running the lar- the open source large language models on, you have the compute that the validators have also sourced. Either it's their own compute or it's from those you know from those places where you can run GPUs or CPU. Uh, and inside of the validator software is individual scoring mechanisms, or in in BitTensor you call them reward models. And these reward models are grading the responses from the miners on a certain number of metrics. And it could be uh, a level of complexity. It could be differences from one another. Um, There's even uh, 
reward models now being created for subnet one where you are essentially having you know a battle between two minor responses so which one is a better response rather than just scoring the aggregate you know individually uh, um, and this is happening across dozens of validators that operate on subnet one so every validator let's let's say there's 30 or 40 at the moment um, is querying the entire pool of miners <clears throat> miners there's over there's about a thousand miners on subnet one and this process of scoring the miners is happening continuously 24 7 you know every minute validators are sending out queries every minute miners are providing responses and this provides the basis for which miners are scored and kept active on the subnet so if you're a miner that's providing responses to validators that validators score highly you earn more tau this is the beauty of the incentive mechanism that is bit tensor and when i say that it's differentiated from Bitcoin, this is exactly how it's differentiated, right? You have these miners that if you're just throwing, you know, random responses at the validators, you will quickly lose your slot on the, the subnet, lose your ability to earn the tau that is allocated to that subnet. Uh, you'll have to shut down your compute and you'll have to re-register, spend more tau to get back into the subnet. Meanwhile, if you're a high performing miner, you're getting scores from validators across the the network that puts you uh, at the top of the subnet as far as the emissions that you're earning or the tau that you're earning per day. This also puts you in a category where, depending on how the subnet is designed, you have front ends that are able to use the validators because the validators, in addition to scoring the miners, they also act as um, you know basically the API uh, intermediary between a front end and the source of the intelligence, which is the miner. So if you want to ask a miner a question and you're not a validator, you have to go through a validator uh, to do that. And this incentivizes the validators to hold their tau so that they have more bandwidth to query the miners. And the uh, front ends that, let's say, are a chatbot or something, would go through the validator, source a high-performing miner, and ask that miner a question just like a validator would, and because that miner is incentivized to respond to that validator because of this scoring mechanism, the idea is that miner also responds to whoever out there in the world wants to ask it a question. This creates the entire ecosystem, right? So you have miners that are incentivized to provide good response to validators. You have validators that are incentivized to hold tau and grade the miners because they also receive tau for performing this exercise. And then outside of the BitTensor ecosystem, maybe you know through whatever front end that's existing, you have the ability to get to the miners through the validators. And, and this is what is happening inside of the individual 32 subnets. There's varying mechanisms um, that are used for scoring the responses of miners because you know subnet one with text prompting, you know think of it like a chat GPT or something. This is, this is just the basic thing that everyone understands about artificial intelligence that you can kind of ask an LLM, you know, text questions and receive text responses. But there's varying levels of complexity around that. For example, subnet 2, uh, some, something called bit translate, does something very similar except it's only focused on language translation. They're launching, I think, another half dozen languages today. So they've got a dozen or so languages at this point. They're doing something very similar to subnet 1 except with, with, with translation. Uh, look at subnet 5, for example. Subnet 5 uses the same mechanism as subnet 1, where you have the miners respond to queries from validators, except the queries are in the form of image generation. So you have queries coming from validators asking the miner to you know, create an image of a, a coffee cup you know, with um, whatever steaming steaming stuff coming out of the top of it and all of the uh all of the miners are responding to that those coffee cups are graded against one another by the validators and the miners on subnet five are getting scored on how well did they do image generation subnet eight for example uh is a subnet where we have bitcoin uh price prediction at this point there'll be other financial instruments but for now it's price prediction so what you have is miners providing either 24 or 36 hours sometime in the future. They provide a, a estimated price for Bitcoin, like a, basically a timestamp and a price. And then when that timestamp rolls around, the validators check the actual price of Bitcoin and start grading the miners based upon their ability to 
predict the price of, price of Bitcoin. This can go on for any you, anything you can think of then. It doesn't have to be artificial intelligence necessarily like subnet 1 or subnet 5 where you're using open source LLMs. You know, you can use a time series, you know, sort of prediction algorithm to try and earn tau by predicting the price of bitcoin. If you could actually and and it's and it sounds kind of complicated, but you have to think of it this way. If you could type fast enough, you could be your own miner. You know, because all it's doing is, pro- is is providing input into the system that's being graded by the validators, and that sounds very complicated, but it's just using compute to do that faster than any human could, and it's using all of the intelligence behind whatever models the miners are running to do it in a way that would beat any human. And that's what you have going on in the 32 subnets across you know many, many different modalities. Yeah. Okay, so... Okay, let, let's staying on the on the subnet route. So let's say I was an AI developer. I had an idea of a new thing, and let's just say it's it's turning sound into video. So let's say you could, I want to create an AI app of some sort where you can play a sound like an airplane flying overhead, and then the AI would visualize and make a video of a a plane flying over a field or or, or whatever. Now, obviously. I mean, that may or may not exist, but let's say it doesn't exist. So instead of just launching up a brand new company from scratch and getting investors and seed investors, all that sort of stuff, and, and building a team, because of the, the 18% of um, daily emissions that, are, that go to subnet owners, could I just create a brand new subnet for um, audio to, to video? And then that will be an incentive for me to basically build that, that app in, in the yeah. new subnet yeah so to let me break down how subnets work <clears throat> so in order to in order to get a subnet uh, you have to pay a certain amount of tau and it's and it, when I say pay I just mean a lockup so you don't actually lose your tau but you know it's just while the subnet is operating whatever you paid for that subnet is locked up currently the cost of the subnet is 100 tau so you know the price okay. of tau right now I don't know call it 330 325 or whatever so let's say it's uh, $32,500 uh, that you're going to have to pay in Tau to get that subnet. Yeah, for as long as that what subnet is open. So it's basically no, locked it's, up indefinitely, really, if it, if it does it, well. It, exactly, okay. exactly. And then what that allows you to do <laughs> is, uh, and you mentioned you know, the marriage of uh, GitHub and, and all of these other things into your example earlier, that allows you to uh, you know, use a GitHub repo, for example, to put software out there into the mining and validating community that exists within BitTensor that's going to allow validators to create uh, sounds. You know, this can be through WAV files or MP3s or whatever. They would send those sounds to miners who are running uh, LLMs or some other type of software that could generate a video. And this is something called you know, there may have to be an intermediary that translates there. Maybe yeah. you take the sound, translate to text, and text translates to video. Uh, this yeah. is and this and when I talk about like subnets working together, I'm sure at some point this is going to happen as well. Where you'll have these sort of chains of subnets where subnet you'll babies. have them working. Yeah. Subnet babies, subnet cousins. <laughs> I mean, and they're all working together to sort of get to the the multimodality. Which at this point is is sort of you know uh, the golden goose of AI, right? This is the this is when you're merging speech, audio, video, text all into one. Um, and and in your example, the miners then would be generating their video based on that sound provided by the validators. Mm. And and the subnet that you registered for thirty two thousand five hundred that that opens up your ability to earn tau. So yeah. I don't want to, you know, get everybody uh, too worked up here with all the numbers I'm going to throw around, but just just try to stay with me. You got 18 <laughs> percent uh, every day that's going to subnet owners. Okay. Yeah. So let's say 12.96 a day. Okay, so you've got 12.96 a day. Let's say uh, conservatively, as a subnet owner, you're going to get one percent of that, right? 12.96 a day. Yeah. That, what that means, if you're going to get 12.96 tau per day, uh, which is a payback period of like, what, eight days, not even, a little less than eight days for your mm-hmm. 100 tau, 
And remember, it's not even a payback because it's a lockup. So you didn't actually lose the town in the first place. So you're yeah. you're just basically making money the whole time. <coughs> uh, in order to get that that twelve point nine six tau per day, you have to convince the validators that are operating within the ecosystem to put their weight on your subnet. So if they think that the idea that you have here of taking in your audio and converting it to video is something that is going to not only just further you know the, the bit tensor project in general but it makes sense it has a potential use case for customers outside of the ecosystem or, or you know a front end that could be, be be developed where the validators use an api to ping the miners and then we can generate some additional income out of that outside of just the towel that's being circulated then you have the carrot for the validators to go into what's called the root network and apply their weight to your specific subnet. And how is mm -hmm. that done? Well, for example, uh, the validator that, that we run at BitTensor Guru, um, this validator has just under 5% of the network allocated to it. This means that of the 7,200 uh, tau per day, you know, you've got whatever it is, I don't know, 350, 360 tau uh, per day that our validator and our delegates decide where that tau goes based upon the subnets that we think are valuable. So you have to, as that subnet owner, then go out into the validator uh, sort of you know um, uh, circus that is BitTensor and convince uh, all of us that this is a good idea to put some money in here so that we can uh, bring sound to video to the masses and continue to develop on this platform. And you know, just to give you an idea of, of kind of the the receptivity um, around what you know the validators and the different subnet <clears throat> ideas and these things there's about 10 subnets right now that have been running um w with any consistency for the last two months or so and there's <clears throat> there's about 13 that are that have, that have just gotten off the ground for example the brand new subnet it was just launched a couple days ago um and it has to do with something called map reduce which is around decentralized uh training and reducing the bandwidth required for that pretty complicated they've already got they were launched a couple days ago they got 1.59 percent of the network allocated to them mm. so they're break even in about five days and everything on top of that can be used for hiring developers yeah. marketing you know continuing to develop their their software for their models and their validators and and we're not talking about a you know a small amount of money here if you talk about you know 15 tau per day once you once you break even that's five grand a day yeah they're making 20.6 tau a day yeah right right and so you know if you think like oh man i missed the boat on bit tensor uh i gotta get in you know i how am i gonna buy it? get in now it's 325 the best way to do it is to either if you have any coding ability start a subnet and if you don't have the coding ability get into new subnets as a miner or validator so you can earn POW instead of having to just pay the market price for it. Okay, so quickly just um, going off on that thread, how does an average Joe become a miner in a subnet? Yeah, so uh, this is also very specific to certain subnets. Like there okay. are certain, there are like, subnet nine for example, who is run by one of the founders, uh, founders of BitTensor. Um, is that Steve? This is a subnet. Uh, that's uh, Jacob. Jacob Steves, yeah. yeah. Uh, Const, uh, Const, otherwise yeah. known as Const in, in BitTensor land. Um, this is one where I would not recommend the average person to try and join. This is like where you know the sharks are swimming. It's going to be very difficult to stay registered there because the stuff that's happening there requires you to be doing some very specific things <laughs> with either fine tuning or building your own models. It's not easy to start. But like Subnet Two, for example. Uh, when they launched, they provided videos and a stock miner that anyone could spin up, uh, and it would stay registered. So you could get onto YouTube, cut, you know, figure out how to get your decentralized compute, whether that's a, in that case it's a GPU, yeah. uh, and step by step, just follow the YouTube video and start earning some tau. Okay. Subnet 18, for example, is pretty easy to get running as well. You need an open AI key at a certain tier um, for that one, but there are you know half a dozen subnets at this point that i've seen new miners get up and running on in the last two weeks that had zero experience um in in bit tensor 
So what you're looking for is someone who's trying to get into BitTensor without buying Tau, but you want to mine is new subnets, and then you want to go into the, the GitHub or the pins on the, on the Discord channel and see which ones are walking you through, through the steps to become a miner. And it's and it's it's almost like a course in 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 Python, AI, uh, you know, <laughs> decentralized compute. Yeah. And if you follow the if you follow the instructions, which is all I do is <clears throat> running a validator, is follow the instructions. You can learn enough on the fly um, to to start to start making some real money and and actually earning a carving out a slot for yourself in the ecosystem. And you can you can concentrate on these subnets also. Um, and sort of get better at a specific subnet, or you can target ones maybe that have low registration costs, so you're not, you know, having to fork out a couple hundred bucks to take a swing at the subnet. Maybe it's just two or three dollars to to try your try your miner out. Um, yeah. yeah, and and that's what I would do if I was getting into it. Target the new subnets as a miner. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> don't worry, folks. If you're like, who the hell is this this guy who who knows so much? I will be ta- um, asking more questions about Keith and his validator because I do love what he's doing with his validator. But I just got to get all these questions out. So one of the the, the things I saw on X the other day um, was a guy whining, and he said, um, "Oh, you know, I, I'm done with BitTensor. I think it's going to go to a thousand, but I'm done because if I wanted to play with the LLM, I've got to do this, that, 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 that just before you know I can ask it a question, whereas I can just use open you know Chat GPT and get an answer in two seconds flat." So. Now, although I giggled at watching, um, reading that, because I, I do think that was slightly short-sighted because BitTensor is still basically just a baby. Um, is there, how, so let's take the LLM uh, subnet, you know, or, you know, Ask Howl or whatever. How do those subnets, or how does any subnet plan on commercializing the, the product that they're building? Like, how can they make, um, how can Bit, uh, LLM on BitTensor become as user friendly as say Bard or GPT, Chat Chat GPT. Or is I that not the aim at all? Have, no, I think it is the for some of the subnets this is definitely the aim. You know, the aim is to create a back end that can, you know, through the API that, that BitTensor has um, plugged into a validator, you know, serve a front end that, that has a specific use case in the real world, whether like you said it's an LLM or something else. Uh, I'll give you one specifically. Our validator is working with a company that is currently operating in the uh, translation space, language translation space, and you know they're eyeing a creation of a subnet or possibly even using subnet two to power uh, several aspects of their existing business. So rather, they use uh, they leverage artificial intelligence through ChatGPT. Uh, so they use the API there to basically, um, you know, create the value for their customers for their language translation. So they've created an app that just uses uh, ChatGPT as a back end. But if you think about them working with Subnet2, for example, they can form a relationship with a validator. They don't have to pay OpenAI for that necessarily. There is no OpenAI. The back end is the, uh, is the Tau ecosystem that through the mining and validating process is creating enough value that they don't actually have to pay for compute. And in the, in the, in the other um, aspect of that, where if they wanted to create their own subnet, for example, to do something similar to subnet two, to serve their existing business, which is already generating income through the API they have with OpenAI, then they're, to, then they're able to actually generate, then their, their compute becomes a profit center. Instead of having to pay for their compute through an entity that can shut them off at any time, now they're operating on a a decentralized platform where they have control over the incentive mechanisms that are generating the responses for their specific app, and they can tailor the entire uh, back end to exactly what they need for their application. And this is an existing business that's happening today that's running, that's profitable, and these guys are considering opening up a subnet to basically replace OpenAI. Okay, so I'm just going to imagine that the typical response to that question would be, well, but surely it's still a faff because you then have to get Tau to, to, to use it, whereas I could get an API with ChatGPT and it cost me $20 a month. Like, so... Uh, if all you want to do is, you know, uh, ping questions back and forth to, um, to a large LLM, 
you can do that on BitTensor too. We have Subnet 18, which uses um, uh, OpenAI as its back end. So it's something called Coursell. Cool. Uh, we could we could share the link at the end of this maybe with the group okay. here. But uh, if you take a look at Coursell, that is using OpenAI as its back end. And you don't have to pay 20 bucks a month for it. There was 60,000 people using it in the first 24 hours and it's free. And the, the way that that works is that uh, miners are used through the validation process to ensure that they're using OpenAI as their source. And, uh, you know, the, the validation, or sorry, the, the front end of Corsell uses the validators to ping the miners and brings back responses into the front end that looks very, very similar to what you have with ChatGPT. And you even have access through Corsell to uh, versions of GPT like GPT-4 Turbo uh, that you aren't even able to use with the normal front end when you pay 20 bucks a month. So we, Subnet 18 is, is just like destroyed the whole open AI argument because you could just come on BitTensor and use the um, front end there for free and it's even a better version than you get if you pay 20 bucks. Um, but I, I don't think that necessarily what we're doing with BitTensor is trying to, uh, you know, take on open AI through this 20, yeah. you know, providing a $20 a month <clears throat> platform. In fact, subnet 18, which just came online online like three weeks ago, was basically just created uh, to sort of erase that entire argument because using the generative process within BitTensor, we don't even have to charge for that front end at this point. Yeah. Okay. And, and I guess doing a bit of a side step here, um, can you explain a bit more, again, treating us all like five-year-olds, um, the proof of work and the proof of stake side? So, because a lot of newbies I've seen on X saying, oh, I'm not, you know, I'm, ne I'm never touching another proof of stake um, uh, uh, project again. And uh, and obviously, BitTensor isn't a proof of stake. It's, it's, it's sort of like a hybrid. So can you just elaborate more on that, please? Yeah. Uh, it because it has no hash you know, rate, of, but it is more proof of useful work, if that makes sense, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, proof of work in BitTensor, um, I would really call that sort of a misnomer. Yeah. Uh, there used to be an element of proof of work where you could use a certain amount of compute to get registered on a subnet. Uh, this is maybe going to be reintroduced at some point, but that has been scrapped in favor of recycling tau, which push, pushes out the halving date as a registration mechanism. Um, for miners and validators on a subnet. So proof of work doesn't even at this point really happen uh, in BitTensor. If you're talking about proof of stake, first of all, miners, to mine on BitTensor, it doesn't matter how much tau you have. You could have one tau, a thousand tau, uh, your miner, it does, your miner scored on based on what it's contributing to the network, not on the amount of tau that it holds mm -hmm. on your key. So mining is a completely level playing field as far as, as tau is concerned. The validation side and why there's, you know, approaching 90% of the tau in circulation staked at this point, this is where, you know, you might be able to, to draw some comparisons to proof of stake because what BitTensor does is, is, is creates a competitive nature amongst the validators uh, to hold as much tau as possible because as a large validator, miners are incentivized to respond to you, whereas if you're a small validator, miners are not incentivized to respond to you because you're not making a big enough difference in the scores that are happening uh, for that miner if you don't hold enough tau. So, for example, if you hold you know, 10,000 tau, you can probably get registered as a validator on, on some of these subnets, and I think you could probably you know, hang on by the skin of your teeth, but there's going to be a lot of miners that don't want to respond to a 10,000 tau validator because most of the scoring that's being done by the validation mechanism comes from, you know, the top 10, the top 20 validators. And to get in that group, you know, you're talking about, I don't know, north of 40, 50,000 tau. And this is what creates then the uh, ecosystem that allows the validators to use APIs to ping the miners because this basically is opening the, when you hold enough tau, it opens the door to the entire ecosystem. This is why you have large validators with, you know, 500, 600,000 tau. We've got several over 200,000. I think the top 10 at this point is all north of 100,000 tau. When you hold that much tau, 
Um, you know, you've basically got a thirty, forty million dollar business that has it's open season on the intelligence that's being generated from the miners across the subnets. And this is why you don't see a lot of tau for sale. Because every validator that's operating on the network, and most of them at this point have been operating for some time, you know, most a year plus, the larger ones, understand the value of what they hold because they see the access it grants them to the thousands of miners across the different subnets. And when you hold a certain amount, when you hold, let's say, you know, 100,000 tau, any subnet that you get registered on, you know, you have now the ability using an API to pull that intelligence out and serve a front end that you can design. You don't have to wait for the subnet owner to design the front end. You can do it yourself. Mm. Okay. I like, yeah, I like that. So one of the questions um, which uh, I, I immediately thought of when I saw the, the, the staking yield and the validating stake yield is uh, where does the yield come from? Now you have to understand that myself and a lot of my followers and students and whatnot, we all are, have PTSD from rebasing DAOs. <laughs> like Olympus DAO, Wonderland, all that sort of stuff. And that gravy train in 2021 was great for you know the, the six months I was in it. I actually made profits from that whole gravy train um, and then got sort of slapped in the face with Wonderland a little, a little bit. Um, so Obviously, back with the rebasing DAOs, all of the yield came from this highly inflationary uh, emission curve, right? Now, obviously, BitTensor's emission rate is very much like Bitcoin's, you know, and it's relatively high at the moment because it's so young. Um, so the first question I had was, you know, where does the yield come from? And obviously, I mean, we, we can work that out. This two, two, 7,200 emitted per day. And then the miners and validate the miners and validators get forty one percent each. So I just did some calculations and worked out that even if a hundred percent of of circulating supply was all staked, there'd still be loads left over. Um, it, is that correct, or am I explaining it poorly? You mean what do you mean loads left over? So if a hundred percent of the circulating supply was was completely staked. Um, or you know, locked up, they would be getting, I guess, if you picked a rough average, what twenty six percent APR. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. So right now, let's say we're at, uh, you know, we're eighty eight percent or something. I think stake. Yeah. Um, and you know, your APR, if you're running a validator, is something around, you know, twenty three. If you're a good validator. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's that. That means you're operating on every single subnet that's how you get at high APR is you operate on all the subnets if you just operate on one subnet you only get the emissions from that APR so this incentivizes the validators to operate across the entire network yeah the worst this the worst the APR can get uh, let's say if everyone staked all their tau now uh, the APR would go down by what 12% whatever the you know and I don't mean 12% is a whole number I mean it would go down you know you multiply the APR by 0.87 or 0.88 or whatever so you'd still be up in the high 20s I'm sorry in the in the high teens or low 20s yeah uh, because the 7200 tau per day compared to the tau in circulation is still a high mark you know as the 7200 tau per day continues to churn until the first halving which will happen at some point in early 2025 your your APR is necessarily reduced because the amount of tau staked compared to the amount of tau generated, you know, the amount of tau staked keeps, yeah. keeps going. Yeah, and there is no variable like, uh, you know, this isn't strong block. You know, there is no, <laughs> like, uh, there is no way to like, uh, you know, uh, buy a special uh, NFT and then attach it to your validator uh, and then, you know, start earning more tokens. We have some validators that are doing some strong blocky type things, but uh, <laughs> outside, outside Outside of those guys, you know, as far as the ecosystem is concerned, you can't make any more than 7,200 tau. There's no way to do it. It's not. Yeah. There's no mechanism for it. So your APR is never going to get wonky. It's only going to continue to go slightly down until the first halving, and then just like Bitcoin, it'll get chopped in half at that point. Yeah. Nice. So, can so obviously you have one of the biggest uh, validators on the network, something like fifth. Um, why and. and uh, can you explain to everyone um, the amazing thing that you've just done? Because you've come out of invite only to now, 
um, free, you know, out there for everyone. Um, and your staking APR that you're giving to nominators is probably the highest out of all the validators. Can you just explain a bit more about that? Yeah, the way that the way that we run our validator, and we've been running it this way. Uh, I've been running a validator since October of, of 2022, and the entire time we've been doing it just like this. We just, like you said, never really opened it up to public staking, but. The way that it works is that you know your validator. <clears throat> I'm trying not to get this confused with subnets because there's a lot of 18 percent numbers floating around yeah. in the BitTensor ecosystem. <laughs> that confused the hell out of confusing. me. <laughs> yeah, but the way that it works as a validator. So now we're on a whole new topic. We didn't really talk about delegating yet, right? But, oh yeah, true. So 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 our validator holds uh, roughly five percent of the network. Um, we're maybe I think we're fifth on verified validators through Tau Stats, which is kind of like the blockchain explorer and the, e the way to look at the ecosystem um, that, that someone called Mog Machine, who's who's very active in the BitTensor community. Verify your validator through Tau Stats. So I think we're fifth there, but overall I believe we're eighth at five percent of the network. Oh, okay. And uh, you know, very little of that Tau is actually my Tau. Uh, we have over a hundred delegators who stake, and delegating is just the BitTensor term for staking. So they have staked their tau to our validator, and what this does uh, in BitTensor is allows validators um, to build up their stake without having to have any trust issues. Um, you know, back in the early days of BitTensor, the only way to build a validator was to take somebody's tau in your possession and put it on your cold key. And, uh, you know, that required a certain level of trust, created some opportunities for exploitation that I myself, uh, you know, fell victim to. No, sure. uh, thankfully, we are we are beyond that point and everything is trustless. So when you delegate your tau to a validator, that validator, that validator can't take it or do anything with it. It's still your tau. It's still on your key and you can take it back at any point. There's no lockup period. Uh, and as delegators, you earn. 82% uh, of what a validator earns. So if I'm bringing in uh, 100 tau per day as a validator, uh, 18 tau stays on my, you know, I earn 18 tau for running the validator and 82% of the tau that I bring in, so 82 tau in this example, is distributed to uh, all of the delegators on my validator. And that is um, done by, you know, of course, the, the weight or the amount of tau that they're staking. So if someone has staked half of the tau on my validator in this example, they would get half of the 82 tau that I'm earning uh, per day. So they would get 41 tau, and uh, it, well, I would get 18% of that for running the validator. So the way that we do it with the BitTensor Guru validator is we take that 18% and we just give it all back to everybody at the end of the month. You know, there was a mechanism, this mechanism was created in the beginning uh, for BitTensor to allow validators to basically become builders within the network, this 18%. Uh, you know, maybe you could tell from the way that I'm speaking here, I don't know. I am not a coding expert. I'm pretty dangerous. If you give me an LLM in my hands, I could do a little coding if I can ask it some questions or something. But me building on the network personally is pretty difficult and my ceiling is definitely not as high as someone who has AI ML experience or is or is you know some kind of some kind of brain with coding so as an acknowledgement of that basically and also just because it's our ethos we aren't going to be you know skimming the 18% from anybody that's delegating with us because honestly most of the bigger delegators that are on our validator have been on this project for two years at this point. They're some of the first miners and validators that, that, that joined BitTensor back in late 2021. We have enough tau. We're at, we, we have enough, we're earning enough from the tau we already hold that we don't need to take somebody with 10, 50, 100 tau and, and start skimming their 18% off. So yeah. what we do is give it all back at the end of the month. We do it, we, we take out a certain amount for equipment costs, which is just a pass through. Uh, it's like point two percent of our total earnings or something it's running a validator when you're large their equipment costs are almost zero at this point uh and then we take that 18 percent and we transfer it out to everybody so if you go look on the blockchain for the last couple months what you'll see with our validator is that we earn tau uh throughout the month for example in november we earned 700 roughly 700 tau 
for running the validator. Uh, and we took that, you know, $250,000, $200,000, whatever that translates to at this point, and we transferred it all back based on, uh, you know, the amount of stake that each delegator holds on the first of the month. And that's why we have a certain amount of, you know, sway within the ecosystem because delegators want to earn that 18% back. And we feel like at this point, um, you know, we're able to build on the network with the resources we already possess. So we're not interested in holding back that 18%. Also, one thing that's changed since this entire 18% um, thing for validators was launched is that now you also have the subnets earning 18%. So the way that I look is that, uh, you know, if I'm going to be building on, on the BitTensor network, I'm going to buy a subnet and do it. I'm not going to try and get you know tens of millions of dollars in tau as a validator to scrape together enough from the 18 percent to start building on these subnets so that's where i see the incentive for building happening and you can go look at and, and a lot of the subnet owners at this point don't even run validators or large ones anyway so their profit centers or their incentive to continue to participate in this project comes from the subnets not running a validator nice so i guess for the average person here um, what sort of APR would that average out over the next or until the halving, would you say? Like 25, 26% per year? No, it'll be lower than that. I think for November, what we did as a, as for our validator was something like 22.9%. <clears throat> I think I checked this morning, we're just above 23. It, it varies based upon how well your validators are do, you're doing and that you have a server go down or something, your daily rate will drop. I think probably, you know, if you just, uh, if you think about the next year, you're going to see 7,200 tau times, three, you're going to see the, a dilution of something around 25%, you know, um, sorry, actually it's going to be a little more than that. It's going to be around 50% of the existing tau. So that should reduce, uh, you know, the APR to somewhere in the mid, mid teens, depending on how much is staked, you know? Because it's also going to depend on how much tau is floating around. So you'll see a drop of 23%, let's say, at the high, which is what we're at now, which is what the top validators are earning. Um, and you'll see that drop over the next year to something like maybe 15% by the end of 2024. So for the average investor that delegates with you, um, they, you know, if they were trying to do for cash flow forecasting or, or whatever, like sort of 15% would be safe. Yeah, you know, I, I think you could say if you're going to end at the 17, 18% for 2024, that could be pretty mm -hmm. accurate. I would say you're certainly not going to be under 15 by any means by yeah. the end of the year. But um, doesn't, so that's, the, that's where I would. Uh, okay. Yeah. But in, in the docs, doesn't it say that a normal staker would be guaranteed, the, well, not guaranteed, but. but get, um... oh. No, so the 18% is relative. Right, because it's based uh, okay. upon the um, yeah, it's based upon the amount of tau generated per day and the amount of tau staked. So even though the seventy two hundred is generated today, you're earning less for every thousand tau you have staked every day. I see. Got it. Okay. And that's a good thing. Yeah, no, no yeah, I, I completely agree. Because that's making that's why the price is going up. <laughs> right? Because everyone's trying to hold on to their tau, not only to continue to earn more tau. But you've got the the biggest holders in the entire project, the validators. <laughs> you can go look, and I mean, it's all it's all on chain at this point. Nobody's selling, uh, and mm. this is the you know, if you're looking for a, a metric for how you think this project is going to go, the the people that are deepest into BitTensor aren't selling anything. Yeah, and are you limiting the amount of nominators in the future for for your validator? Uh, no, we have, uh, thanks, thankfully, we have uh, a, a certain delegator who is good enough at coding, who has made this process of giving back the 18% very easy, so we don't have any you know, techni technical limitations as far as distributing tau back to, to our delegates. Nice. Okay. And uh, before I hand it over to, I've got two more questions, then I'll hand it over to the audience here. So, quick fire. Um, you said that uh, with the tokenomics, it is slightly deflationary. How deflationary? No, there, I don't know if these numbers are actually published. Uh, I do know, for example, though, that uh, 10,000 tau 
has been burned on registrations just for subnet one. And so th what that means is if you want to participate in, sub in just one of the 32 subnets as a miner or a validator, you need to take a certain amount of tau, whatever the registration cost is for that subnet. And for subnet one, it's almost always north of one tau. I'm not sure what it is today. Um, but that tau is taken from your wallet and added on basically to the end of the distribution cycle for uh, the 21 million. It doesn't create another coin, right? It just extends the halving date and pushes out the halving date based upon additional tau being created in the future and one less tau existing in the ecosystem today. Uh, okay. Fair. There's also a very small burn uh, for every every uh, transfer, but that's nothing. It's like a point zero 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 one four five or something. It's yeah. a very, very small number. You know, you would never notice it. And my, I guess my final question is, um, I'm hoping you can fl find some flaw in my logic here that when I look at all these subnets and all the, the, the things that are coming and you know in the future it could be you know, 100 subnets or, or whatnot like what is the actual point of any other crypto AI project because you know everything everything is within BitTensor <laughs> that's whatever I know this has been the uh, this has been the trope that that uh, you know crypto Twitter likes to trot out there is oh just plug it into BitTensor take render plug it in you know take uh, whatever yeah. plug it in it, it's just going to be a subnet I mean hypothetically this is true we have compute subnets we have storage subnets now yeah. so um, we there will be a version we have uh, versions of essentially everything mm. can be created in BitTensor and. You know, the limit of 32 subnets, I'm not sure how long this is going to last. We had a limit of 12 subnets that lasted like two weeks, and now we're at 32 <laughs> within two months, so it'll probably be 64 in the near future. It's probably a great chance for some governance to be exercised within the protocol, which we haven't talked about yet. But hmm, with the um, yeah. Yeah, you know, this, and I think this is what I was trying to say earlier, um, maybe on the call when I was bumbling around with my explanation, but I can't find the end of the thread. You know, mm. I don't know where the thing ends. All I know is that every time I pull on it, there's just more that comes out. You know, and this is like, this is what BitTensor is because of the of the design of the thing, and you know, the protocol itself. If you look back to what's been done over the last two years, I think this is important too. The way that this project is designed is totally opposite from the way every other piece of technology operates. You know, mm. normally you have like some VCs that are finding a bunch of guys, they're going, they're in some garage or basement, they, they hammer out some alpha or beta version of something, you know, quickly try to put it together so that the market will accept it and get a user base and start generating profits so that the original VCs can start flipping their in investment for a 10, 20, 100x, whatever it is, and they have rounds of this happening, right? Mm. Um, the way that BitTensor works is you're actually paying miners miners earning almost half of the tile that's produced every day to try and figure out how to use the least amount of compute, spend the least amount of money to provide the highest quality intelligence. And sometimes that even means that they're trying to trick the validators or use certain like post-processing, um, you know, algorithms and these type of things to make their submission look more intelligent than it actually is, or make it look like it's providing more value um, than it does. And this creates a, an evolution across the entire ecosystem because what you have is a bunch of people earning money for basically trying to do good things sometimes, but also tr trying to break it down. And every time they succeed at you know uh, weakening the quality of the responses that the, that the subnet owner is trying to create, the subnet owner has to go back into their existing code for their miners and validators and improve the quality of the output coming out. And this churn that is happening, this is like when I say I can't find the thread of BitTensor and where it ends, it's because this is happening now across 32 different subnets. And you have teams of people working on trying to tease out higher quality responses from the, uh, from the miners using a number of different unique reward models. And the other beautiful thing is when one subnet figures out how to do something like, oh, hey, we just figured out how to stop miners from doing this one specific practice that was weakening or lowering the quality of our responses. The entire thing is open source. So now any subnet can go into that subnet owner's repo on GitHub, 
see the code. We have there's a specific Discord where everyone's sharing all of these upgrades to their subnet that the code that they're doing, and then everything can improve. So once mm. one subnet sort of like finds a, a great solution, it will then permeate the rest of the subnets and improve the entire ecosystem. And also one more thing before we open it up, yep. which I forgot to mention earlier, the entire project is like, you know, strapped on to the rocket that is the open source artificial intelligence movement itself. So yeah. when any of these large open source, uh, you know, projects, or even smaller guys that are just creating individual LLMs with single person or a couple person teams, anytime a new LLM comes out, and these these LLMs now, open source ones, are just a couple of months behind, uh, you know, the cutting edge stuff from Anthropic or or OpenAI that's customer facing. These things can be used immediately to improve many, many aspects of the BitTensor ecosystem, not just on the mining side, but also on the validating side. So as the intelligence increases in the open source movement in general, which it is every day, almost exponentially at this point, BitTensor also improves. Nice. So, right, let's open up. Um, I'm going to try and do it in order of hands up. So, uh, uh, Manny, I, th I believe you were first, and then Adam. Um, Manny, go for it. What's your question, buddy? In fact, whoever's first to unmute themselves is first. <laughs> Adam, go for it. Hello. <laughs> sure, 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 sure. Um, this kind of answers sort of skirts around this. Um, right, I, I'll just ask you a like, really stupid kind of question. How, uh, how could this go wrong ex existentially? Nice. Existentially, you mean from like a risk standpoint? Just, you know, how, how could this all go completely tits up? Yeah. Uh, well, let's say I could see one way that this happened, um, at least for the current iteration of BitAnswer, is that you have someone with, uh, I don't know, $50 billion comes in and tries to buy the whole thing and shut it down. Um, but, you know, thanks, thanks to the fact that it's open source, it'll just pop up again in a different iteration so you can't kill it you know you could you could buy it out yeah. and then try and turn it into something but on, you know the dna of the people that are involved in this project um is now sort of like merged with BitTensor dna so if you if you try to kill it by buying it out it'll just pop up again yeah. um the as far as like existential you know oh we're gonna we're gonna create the uh, accidentally create the singularity here because of the subnet system, you know, and, and even some, if you look at the legislation that's been, you know, coming out specifically uh, in the U.S. for, you know, trying to meter the amount of, like, compute you can use with H100s or whatever, this is not something that the tenter is ever going to uh, you know, approach on the individual subnet level. And, and if you try to shut it down as an entity, you know, there's no way to do it. That, it's just like Bitcoin. You can't shut down uh, Bitcoin miners either because the whole thing's distributed all over the planet. So even if you say, uh, oh, well, you, you know, data centers in the US, you're no longer allowed to plug them into BitTensor. Uh, there's enough data centers. I mean, I've, a bunch of my servers are in Europe at this point. And if Europe shuts down, they'll be in, you know, they'll be, they'll be somewhere else in the world. The, the whole thing is going to shift and move just like Bitcoin has if the regulatory agencies start coming after it. And there's actually no reason for the regulatory agencies to start coming after it. The only, the only way that would happen is if the larger players in, in, in Washington and across the world, for example, like an open AI, petition the government to try and shut it down. Uh, and close it off, but but the way that it works, it, it's just going to squeeze and, and squeeze out into a different vector and, and come right back. You know, that's the beauty of it. It's open, it's decentralized. You can't shut it down. You can't keep anyone out. That's caused a lot of problems. A lot of people are still anonymous, actually operating in the ecosystem, which some people think is a good thing, some people think is a bad thing. Uh, but there is no way to gate it at this point. Hmm. Nice. Anyone else have any questions? Rome, Roman, is your hand still up, buddy? If you have questions, feel free to put your hand up and request the mic. Um, so whilst I'm waiting for questions, I, I one other thing uh, popped up. So ha what about Google and OpenAI? Is there a way that they would ever try and plug into the subnets anyway? 
to try and use like for example one of the subnets has scraped reddit and twitter on a daily basis surely that's a mm -hmm. huge valuable data set there yeah there are valuable data sets being generated across a number of subnets at this point um do i think that google well first of all google has already got its toe you know dipped into bit tensor there if you do a little homework on who's invested at this point there's a couple of early um early investors into BitTensor. And when I say investors, it's not the tip. They had to buy the token on the open market just like everybody else. But uh, a company called uh, DCG, a Digital Currency Group, I believe it is, <laughs> is a subsidiary. Yeah. I think they're a subsidiary of Google. Um, and if they're not, yeah, I'm pretty sure they're. So uh, Google's already essentially in through one of its arms. You know, Google's got, of course, many businesses or Alphabet or whatever they call themselves at this point. Um, but I don't know if these larger companies are eventually going to, uh, you know, bite the bullet and, and create a subnet here and, and join this movement. I could see someone like Facebook doing it because Facebook has already, you know, proven to be sort of an ally of the open source community by releasing, you know, their large language models or meta. Um, and uh, so that's a company I could see doing it. But I'm not sure about the larger ones. It's certainly possible. Nice. Cool. We have Roundtable. Go for it, but I was just was just clarifying on the DCG side of things. Uh, no, they're not a subsidiary, a subsidiary of Google. They are one of the biggest uh, players in the crypto space, though. Uh, they own uh, they own Genesis, uh, which kind of had a bit of drama with Gemini yeah. last year. Uh, they own Grayscale, and then they also own Foundry. Uh, Foundry operates the third biggest validator in Potenza, and they're also the largest miner. So not foundry is in the the big one of the the huge Bitcoin mining miners. Yes, yes, is in the big Bitcoin miner. That's owned by BCG. Holy shit! Yeah, because there's two yeah, mining BCG. pools that have more than fifty one percent of the Bitcoin hash rate right now. Yeah, they're, they're part of the, one of the very big pools. They also own Grayscale, which owns yeah. the Grayscale BTC Trust. Okay, so, yeah, there's so some deep pockets there, and you're wait. Correct me if I'm wrong. Aren't you a validator as well? Ah, cool. Makes sense. I thought I recognised the, the name. Uh, yeah. Do you have any uh, thoughts? Uh, any any other thing like from? I mean, uh, from today, any additions to what Keith is saying? Like, as as Keith was saying, the the network is very quickly evolving, and every um yeah that that miners or even validators try to do something squirrely. Uh, the subnet owners are, are able to try to counter that. Um, it's a, a division of power there between miners, validators, and subnet owners, where if any one part is trying to um, act in a way that is not in the interest of the network, the other two the other two sides can work in unison to, to try and fix that issue. So for an example of that, uh, there's been an issue, um, you know, something that has been driving uh, validator operators of the wall is a thing called weight copying, where some validators are, you know, um, doing doing the right thing, running the real hardware, and uh, providing a very valuable service to the network, whilst others are basically just running a little Python script that just scrapes the results that the other the validators are providing, and then blasts it out, pretending it's it's their own, so that you know rather than running you know, thousands of dollars worth of hardware. Uh, they could just have that sitting on a potato uh, and just blasting that out. So this has been an ongoing issue and different subnets are starting to implement new mechanisms to try and block that. Mm. Uh, in the last couple of hours, actually, uh, subnet 18, uh, which is created by Morg, uh, the same guy behind Taustats, uh, he implemented a new system on his subnet that is specifically designed to try and block uh, weight copiers. So we're really looking forward to seeing how that goes because uh, as, as Keith said, these subnets are open source, so if that works, the other subnet owners uh, have a very strong incentive to go through and go, hey, we're going to implement this too. Uh, likewise, um, the validators and the miners on those subnets, um, you know, the, the copiers of course, are also going to be very motivated to say, hey, subnet owner, if, if you want us validators to, to vote for emissions to send to your subnet, um, then we really want you to implement uh, these new scripts to, to do this because it stops people uh, from gaming the system. 
It also helps lead to a better quality output because the validators are doing a really valuable job of gauging the output that the miners are doing. But if someone's just copying away, that's just kind of filling yeah. it up with junk data. So that's that's a, sort of a, a real example of where things are evolving very, very quickly and help changes happening just today. Nice. Yeah, it's that whole congruent incentive-based competition which just makes everything better. Um, love it. Keith, um, like I, I've... I guess I've run out of questions now and I can't see any other hands being put up. Um, are there any questions that I, we haven't asked today which we really should be as noob investors? <laughs> no, I think, this, I think this last point that was highlighted is, is really the secret sauce behind BitTensor, you know, the, the addressing the weight copying or something else called blacklisting where miners can ignore the Take the example I gave earlier about miners ignoring smaller validators. We also have subnet operators that are attempting to uh, solve that issue. And there's been, you know, since I've been involved in this project for a year and a half or so, you know, every time one of these issues pops up, you know, there's there's like, you know, profits declaring the end of the project and then we'll never, every single one has been fixed and every single, you know, sort of issue along the way has been addressed in almost immediately with a very elegant solution uh, immediately in terms of you know a couple of months usually which is pretty fast it's, as far as development is concerned so the thing that's you know beautiful for operating on BitTensor is uh, it, it, once you're in the ecosystem uh, as a miner or a validator you you're getting to watch the evolution of a piece of technology that is so disruptive and unique not only within just the crypto you know universe here but also within artificial intelligence leveraging the open source movement as well and I, I don't see anything else you know I hold a little bit of Bitcoin just as the hedge almost like it's digital gold or something right but everything else I have is in BitTensor because it's an or it's almost an organism at this point you could almost see it as alive and the ways that it's developing um, are not only unpredictable but also just inspiring um, and some of the subnet owners and the and the solutions that they're creating to addressing not only real world problems but going off in totally different directions that you would never expect for a subnet um, are creating value on this project and, and like I said creating a thread that the more you pull on it the more it comes out of the wall and you have no idea where it's gonna end so I love operating a validator it's right at the end of at the edge of my technical abilities but at this stage you know we can still do it as um, as, as Roundtable mentioned, you know, he and I, you know, run validators the right way. We rent the right hardware. We run the software as the subnet owners intended. And at this point, you can still do it with one person. You know, at some point, this whole thing is going to blow up into 64 subnets, 128 subnets. There's going to be teams of people operating validators. There's going to be artificial intelligences operating validators. There's going to be APIs plugged into dozens or if not hundreds of front ends across the internet solving all types of of artificial intelligence solutions for end users and and you can see this coming it's it's coming down i can actually i don't know how long it's going to take six months a year to get to that point mm -hmm. it might it may be less than that but it's it's fun to be a part of this thing and in the last two months i've seen it explode in the, in ways that i could never have imagined six months ago so i'm happy to be along for the ride and you know, if you want to join us on this ride, you can hop on the BitTensor uh, Guru Validator. Roundtable is another excellent validator. Some of the other validators that I would, I would recommend taking a very close look at is the, the largest validator, the OpenTensor Foundation. Uh, Mog Machine, who runs the Tau Stats and Bit API Validator, is, is another one that, that I think is doing great work. Uh, Neural Internet is another one who just launched the Compute Subnet S27. Uh, they, they do fantastic work as well so um, those nice. are some of the players in the ecosystem that, that we see as allies amazing I, um, I, I'm going to have to end it there I'm 22 minutes late for, for, for dinner and my wife is <laughs> <laughs> blowing up on WhatsApp um, and I've got to do the kids so and yeah that was a great ending and Keith thank you so much for your time uh, for being here today uh, I know it's pretty early your end because you're LA area aren't you 
yeah. yeah. Well, thanks for doing this, though. It was a fantastic morning, and I'm happy to do another one if we if we get to the point where we'd like to do In the future, like yeah. Amazing. Um, yes, this is all being recorded, so, yeah. Um, thanks, everyone, for being here and, and all the questions, and uh, have a good one, folks. Cheers, all. Toodles.